In this video, I want to go over three tips that you can use to help you understand how to graph piecewise functions. Piecewise functions is one of those arch nemesis of my students. They would struggle with them and have a hard time understanding when I would give them a piecewise function they never saw before. We know that's the one you typically see on the test or exam, right? I don't want you to fall into that trap. So let's follow these three tips so therefore you can have a better understanding for graphing piecewise function. Now, the first tip that you absolutely need to know about graphing piecewise functions is know the parent graphs. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know how to graph a line, y equals mx plus b. You need to know what a graph looks like for a horizontal line or if you have a vertical line right? You need to know, make sure you know those differences. Now I'll go through the identity function for each of those. Like here is going to be the y equals x. You need to make sure you guys know the quadratic, right? That's going to be y equals x squared. And I don't want to leave any of them off. You know, you can do a video. I have a video on um, the, 12, uh, uh, the 12 parent functions. So make sure you know all of these functions. So I don't care if you need to get a um, flashcards flashcards are or if you need to write them on your uh write them on your mirror in in your bathroom before you are brushing your teeth like whatever you need to do to make sure you know the differences of all these graphs it's going to be crucially important okay so we're going to go over the exponential function it's going to look something like this and what's important about these in addition to just knowing what these graphs are, is also knowing what the transformations are for these graphs. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. And I'll just do a quick little summary. Uh, don't forget the natural logarithm, right? So make sure you're knowing all of these graphs. And again, these are the ones that are gonna come up the most most often. Um, obviously, there are other functions that you could you know, work with. I'm not gonna go over every single type of possibility you could have. But I want to go over some of the more important ones that when I ask a student to be able to graph them, oops, that's actually incorrect. Come on, Mr. McLogan. The reciprocal function looks like that and looks like that. So it's critically important. And then we can also go over some trigonometric functions, depending on where you are in your course. If you've dealt with sine or cosine, making sure you know what the parent graph looks like, y equals a cosine of x. That one's going to look like this. Now, there's all these other trigonometric functions, and there's more functions that um, we could talk about, and I'm not going to go into the details. It's just make sure you understand these parent graphs as well as the characteristics of these parent graphs, and then understand what are the transformations going to look like. So if I have a function of f of x, remember, make sure you understand that, uh, let's see, b times x minus c plus d. It doesn't matter what your function is, right? f of x could be any one of these functions. You could have x, x squared, square root of x, e to the x, and natural logarithm x, absolute value. All of these functions behave the exact same way with transformations. So just a quick little review. Remember, a and d are outside of my function f of x. Those are going to be what we call vertical transformations. A is vertically stretching or compressing the graph. It's also a reflection about the x-axis, which is vertical. D shifts your graph up or down, depending if it's positive or negative. When you're talking about transformations that are inside of the function, those are going to be what we call our horizontal transformations. So B is a horizontal stretch or compression or a reflection about the y-axis, which again is horizontal. C shifts the graph left or right. And again, remember, that's also going to be its x minus C. So it's always going to be in the opposite direction. So minus one would be a shift of graph one unit to the right. So once you know your transformations, once you know what your functions are, that is going to be the fundamental thing to make sure you have down pat before you start graphing as well as understanding your, uh, your piecewise functions. I was like mixing up my words. All right, the number two. The next thing you absolutely need to know is what are the restrictions of your graph? So let's just kind of go through an example. That's the best way to kind of explain this tape here. So let's say if I had a graph of negative x, 3, and let's see, x minus 2, quantity squared. Let's just go with there. Now, these are going to be your three functions, right? And I would expect, based on what I just taught, that you could be able to graph all three of these. Now, if I was to graph all three of these on the same axis, okay, if I was to graph these all three on the same axis, there would be the negative x. I would have 3 would look something like here. Don't worry about my scale. And then x minus 2 shifted two units to the right. So 1, 2, 3. There you go. And x minus 2 would look something like this. 
Now, what do you guys recognize that is a problem with this function? Well, it's not a function, right? This function fails the vertical line test miserably, right? If I just go and grab a nice little vertical line here, I have a X across here, it crosses there, and it crosses there, right? For a function to exist, it can only pass the vertical line test at one single point. So in this case, this is not a function. F of X is not a function. That's why we have the restrictions. So when you are seeing a, um, a piecewise functions, there's going to be restrictions on that function. So it might look like this. X uh, is less than or equal to negative 2. And then you say if uh, negative 2 is going to be less than X, which is less than or equal to positive 2. And then X is going to be greater than 2. Okay, so a lot of students will get confused because they see these functions that are like, all right, I know how to graph a function, you know, in itself, right? I know I can graph a line, but then this just kind of confuses me. So what I want you to do is just to separate this, just to understand what's going on. And what I like to do with my students is, again, this is something that parts comes in like my tip for graphing them, but... I don't want you to keep them on there because I don't want you to think of them as asymptotes, right? They're not an asymptote. This was me using this as a vertical uh, vertical line test, but we're not represented as an asymptote. But what I want you to do is just to focus on these restrictions. Before you focus on the functions, let's just focus on these restrictions real quick. When I see negative two, I'm just going to go over to negative two on my graph and I'm just going to draw a vertical line, okay? Because what that's doing is that's telling me where we're going to transform, transfer from one function to the next. And then I see another at two, and I'm going to go over to two. All right. So what this is doing is when we have piecewise functions, it's just a combination of two or more functions. And you can see in this case, we have three different functions. So what these vertical lines are doing is that are just separating what we're going to do from one function to the next. Now, the third tip, I'm going to come back to this. But the third tip is to do what you know, right? So many students get, get hung up on things they don't know with a math problem. And I just want you to like take a deep breath, settle down and be like, all right, you know what? Let's just focus in on what we do know. What can we do? So let's just look at these individually. Y equals negative X, Y equals three, and Y equals eight X minus two quantity squared. I want you to feel confident in what you're doing. So what I'm going to tell you to do is, you know what, until you get like some real good practice with graphing piecewise functions, just graph each of these graphs separately. Okay. So negative X is going to look something like that from there, right there. Um, y equals three. Hopefully you recognize that is a horizontal line with a Y intercept of three. So one, two, three, that's going to look something like this. And then we have x equals negative 2, which is quantity squared, which is a quadratic function. And so that is going to be what we call our U-shaped graph, but it's going to be shifted two units to the right, right? Because that's a horizontal transformation. So two units to the right. And so that's going to look something like that, okay? Now what I want you to do is kind of go back over to, to this piecewise function and these restrictions, okay? So now I'm actually going to kind of combine um, number two as well as tip number three because I identified my restrictions, okay? And that's critically important to not get involved with all the mess. Just identify the restrictions and put them on the graph. Now, in tip number three, I've graphed them separately. Let's go and look at where these restrictions are. Let's take x equals negative and negative x. Now, again, the restriction for this was x is less than or equal to negative two. So what that's telling me is this graph is only defined for x values that are less than negative two. Now, I know my scaling is not perfect here, but this is going to be at negative two. So it's only defined from here and then for values that are less than negative two, right? So that would be like negative three. So it's going to be values to negative two. Now, technically this point here is negative two, positive two, right? And, but it is defined, right? So there's, it's less than or equal to negative two. So it's going to be a solid point. Now let's go to three. Y equals three, right? Right now that function is defined for all values but we know it can't be defined for all values. If it's part of a piecewise function, we have to restrict it. Now this is going to be restricted from negative two to two. Now negative two is greater, or X is greater than negative two, but it's not defined at negative two. So we're gonna use an open circle. But then at positive two, you can see that it is going to be defined. So I'm gonna use a solid circle. 
and then I'll just go over there. Now, you, sometimes I tell students just like you use a different color marker, that's a great tip, or you can simply just erase it and then just redefine where it's at. And then the third one is x, x minus two quantity squared, but that's only defined for x values that are greater than two. So let's go where two is. It's not defined, so it's an open circle. Now here's three, right, and here's one. So for x values that are greater than two is gonna be everything to the right over here. So this graph is gonna look like this. So tip number three is simply applying those restrictions and now just graph, well, you graph them separately and now graph them separately with the restrictions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we can do is we can go back to this graph that we did in our tip number two, where we had these restrictions and then plot our points and it should all make sense. If I'm gonna go with negative two and that's gonna be up to that point right here, it's defined and it's gonna look like that. Over here at y equals three, that's gonna be from negative two to positive two, and that's defined, and that will look like that. And then over here, I have from two, which is undefined, and that's gonna be an open circle, and then looking there. Now again, again, to not be mathematically incorrect, and these are not, these dashed lines are not a part of the graph, so we can simply go ahead and erase them, because we're using a pencil, right? Um, and therefore, our teacher is not gonna be like, what are, you, what are you doing with these asymptotes, or whatever you got going on here? So we can immediately kind of get rid of them, but I want you to use them yeah. I want you to use them as a way to understand how to graph a piecewise function. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully this video was helpful for you. I know I only went over one example. So if you want to see me go over more examples of graphing piecewise functions, check out the playlist I have for you down below in the description. And if you just want more videos on piecewise functions or math tips, then check out the next video I have for you here. Cheers.